Welcome back 4060 Warners. We will continue in this lecture our discussion of signals and signal hagglers. Uh, previously we had introduced this idea of using the kill command on the command line and also the kill system call in order to deliver signals. And as the name implied, one of the primary reasons for sending signals uh, to a program are to get it to shut down either immediately in the case of kill uh, or gracefully in the terms of that sig ints and sig term. Uh, there are also a few other things you can do with it, communicate a limited amount of information using other signals and potentially suspend it uh, using that sig stop. We also saw that the sig action function is the most recommended function to use to set up a signal handler. Uh, to that, and we're going to continue now uh, with the discussion of these later topics uh, down here, uh, reentrant functions and issues that arise with the asynchronous delivery of signals. Uh, this stuff is covered in some more detail in Stevens and Rago uh, chapter 10. That's our official textbook. Alternatively, you can look uh, to Robbins and Robbins, an older textbook that is sometimes associated with 4061. So uh, we'll pick up with the following slide around 18. It's right after uh, the discussion of this SIG action structure and some of the fields that are present in it. Uh, but the general advice associated with signal handler functions that you would establish, as in, I want to catch this uh, interrupt signal and I want to do something with it, uh, generally try to do as little as possible with it. Uh, make use of only re-entrant functions in that signal handler uh, if you need to use any functions at all. And that requires understanding exactly what is a re-entrant function and why does it matter very much. Uh, the name re-entrant stems just from re-entering uh, into a function and it's somewhat related to recursive functions in that respect uh, and that in the middle of the execution of a re-entrant function it can be interrupted uh, and safely be run again from the beginning uh, not losing any state or altering any state that would affect the previous invocation when it picks up again. We'll have to spend some time uh, to have a look at what's going on with that uh, and we'll see some examples of this is what a re-entrant uh, or a non-re-entrant function looks like and some ways to avoid that but it should be noted right up front that a bunch of our favorite functions are all not re-entrants. And this includes things like printf and malloc and free. Uh, to that end, all of those signal handlers that we were demonstrating earlier that have printing in them, uh, they are actually somewhat unsafe as signal handlers go, although uh, in a lot of cases you can get away with things that may break down under more pressure. Uh, this is also related somewhat to thread-based programming, uh, where you have multiple different entities within the same program, uh, execution threads, all doing things independently, sometimes simultaneously. Uh, although there isn't a strict overlap between functions that are thread safe and those that are re-entrant, that the re-entrant part is actually a little harder to get at. Um, but uh, we'll sort of uh, start that discussion soon. Demonstrate uh, some of the things that are associated with this. Uh, we're going to have a look at this uh, non-reentrant.c file, which is associated with the code pack. Uh, we'll look at this and several other examples to get you a uh, sort of. In, invested in this. Uh, here are a few things up front. We're going to see that the uh, uh, this code, non-reentrant.c, uses the get pw uh, name uh, function. This is a, a system call that makes a request to get some information about a user. If I remember right, it gets you some sort of a password field associated with them, uh, but just don't fret. It doesn't reveal any information that would be unsafe uh, for, for users. Uh, usually you can either only ask about yourself uh, or if you ask about someone else and their password uh, then it gives you some dummy information back. Uh, but very importantly, uh, this function will return a struct of some kind. Uh, and one of the things that you can look at in that struct is the field called pw underscore name. And if you pass in a username like quote Kaufman, uh, then this pw name field should also be quote Kaufman. Uh, we'll see that due to the way that this function is implemented, this get, get pw name, which is actually a standard Unix uh, sort of quasi system call, um, uh, it is going to be the case that uh, it has all sorts of trouble that can arise uh, when it comes to calls in signal handlers or mixtures uh, thereof. Um, so let's open up that code and we'll see that uh, if we apply enough pressure to this thing, it breaks uh, due to its non-reentrancy. Uh, the kind of pressure that we need to apply uh, comes 
uh, in the form of having a signal handler that's called occasionally. And so we'll talk about this alarm handler business uh, in just a minute, but note here that I'm calling this function get PW name uh, at line 27 in the signal handler. Uh, and we've already said this is a no-no, that if you state that get PW name is non-reentrant, uh, then calling it in an alarm uh, or a handler of some kind, a signal handler, this is a bad idea. Uh, so we'll revisit this in just a second. Uh, you'll also see then in the main function down here, it's called in this loop, uh, which is a forever loop uh, here. Uh, a couple sort of setups here. We need to figure out how we're going to actually generate signals that come to this. Uh, and that calls for the introduction of a new function, uh, the alarm function. And this one's relatively simple and super useful in a bunch of contexts uh, that would allow you to periodically do something or mark uh, something to be done. Alarm of one, just ask the operating system, please send me a signal in one second to notify me that one second has elapsed. There's some other ways that your program might affect this, but this is a super cheap and easy way to do it, so long as you know something about uh, signal handlers. And the framework that we laid out in the earlier part of this lecture series uh, puts us in a good position for that, that really all I need to do is set up one of these uh, SA handlers, uh, the SIG action struct, uh, to establish uh, one of those fields, the SA handler, as the function that I want run, and then call SIG action to say, when I get a SIG alarm, uh, run the stuff that's associated with this uh, uh, struct, uh, which happens to be this function in this case, uh, to handle that. And so this is why up top, I named this function uh, alarm handler. Uh, we'll talk maybe a little bit about this static declaration before, but for the moment we can actually just get rid of it uh, um, uh, and uh, it shouldn't affect anything. Uh, but you'll see here that I'm doing things like calling printf, uh, not exactly a great idea, but uh, we'll get away with it for now. What we won't get away with is uh, making calls to this get pw name. And we'll find in a moment that as we run this thing, uh, that the get PW name here was going to conflict and screw up the earlier instances of this that are happening uh, in the main loop for this program. So all this program does is in a loop, as quickly as possible, try to get the password information associated with the username. Uh, that username is stated up top. It's uh, moi. <laughs> And then to just print out after calling this, uh, I get this little struct, this uh, password, it's a pointer to some sort of thing like that. Uh, and then just check to make sure uh, I asked for something on Kaufman and the struct that the operating system returned uh, indeed gave me the username Kaufman for that part. Uh, every so often uh, I'll print out I've done 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 times I've done this successfully. Uh, but every second or so, uh, at a slightly unpredictable moment in this loop, uh, I'm going to get an alarm uh, by virtue of the operating system's uh, alarm function here, which is going to kick me out of the main loop temporarily up into the signal handler, where I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, call, but this time ask about the root, uh, as in get me password information on the root. This won't actually give me anything useful uh, for cracking a password, but it will demonstrate this system call. Uh, and this uh, get PW name thing, we're going to see it's non-reentrant, and so it has troubles there. Uh, the signal handler as well then will set another alarm so that uh, a second later this whole rigmarole starts over that while I'm looking down here I get kicked out into the signal handler. Let's see how this thing works uh, as we actually compile and run it. Uh, I'm going to save that over here, I'll gcc that's non-reentrant.c. Uh, I'll run it, and we're going to see output uh, stream down here, 1,000 successes, 20,000 successes. Sometimes it takes a little while for this thing to finally kick out, uh, but eventually it does. Uh, and the reason it does uh, is a termination uh, condition down here where if I compare, I asked about the username Kaufman, and I'm looking in the struct the operating system uh, gave to me uh, and checking, is this information on the username Kaufman? Uh, then if uh, that is the case uh, and this um, stir comp yields a zero, then I pass by this. Otherwise, I print out some error information and kick out of the program uh, with the exit one here. So after 70,000 plus uh, iterations of successfully calling the system call and getting information on Kaufman, of getting several different signals and handling that up here, and you can see uh, some spots in here. Actually, no, we didn't get any successes on, uh, oh no, we got some on a root here. So here's a root, uh, here's a root, uh, here's a root lots of times up in the signal handler, this comes out okay. But at some unlucky moment, uh, I called up uh, to this signal handler after receiving an alarm signal. Uh, and on leaving it, uh, 
during the completion of this get pw name in the main loop, uh, something weird happened. Uh, that when I was doing this comparison of Kaufman to whatever the operating system pushed back to me in terms of whose password you requested, it was root instead. This should start to trigger your, you know, spidey sense just a little bit. Like, oh, I kind of start to see why this is potentially a problem. Uh, and I want to go into the details of that because uh, it'll illustrate one of the primary factors uh, about why it is that a function might not be re-entered. But I want you to take just a moment, uh, pause and think about this, about why is it, what is it about these calls to get PW name? Uh, that sort of indicate that, oh, I can see why uh, in the midst of calling it here, if I get interrupted, I might help here uh, down later here that I have uh, I'm comparing Kaufman to Root uh, down here. Think about that for just a second, and then we'll uh, sort of have the big reveal in a moment. All right, so if you were thinking along the following lines that here as I call this uh, system call, I get a pointer to something, but if you scan around, I don't see any freeze or anything like that. Uh, as in this memory that I get a pointer to, it doesn't appear to be mallet in such a way that I'm obligated to um, uh, collect it using a free instance. Uh, then this is an important part of the observation and should lead you to conclude that whatever I'm getting a pointer to here is some sort of internal global variable that's owned by this function but is singular, as in the call here to get PW name is gonna change that global variable. So too, the call up here in the signal handler is gonna change the same global variable. Uh, to that end, this is how in the midst of a call here, where I say, set this up so it has information about user Kaufman, and then I get an interrupt uh, that the alarm goes off and the signal handler gets called. And so I call the function again, change the global variable up here uh, using this get PUF name. So it now has uh, the root user associated with uh, that, that global struct. Uh, when the signal handler finishes and I come back down here and check, do I still have Kaufman or not? I, I do not. Uh, and it's by virtue then of this global variable that must be under the hood associated with this get PW name uh, that makes it a non reentrant function and dangerous to use and intermingle uh, between uh, the signal handler and the main function down here. So then, We've talked just a little bit about then this quality of uh, what makes that get PW name uh, function non reentrant. You'll find these all over the place in system call literature of like, okay, here's a function, and based on the properties of it that I can see, I can infer it's probably not uh, uh, actually um, uh, reentrant and is therefore dangerous to use in signal handlers. Um, I want to illustrate that it's not just system calls that have this problem, that we can easily write some code um, that also has this problem uh, associated with it. And so on the right hand side here is just a little bit of a code block here. Uh, and uh, the main flow of this thing is to understand that uh, in main, uh, we'll set up a signal handler, this time using uh, for simplicity this signal uh, a bit of business, uh, and then call this function f and then print out uh, whatever the V value is, which is what's returned by F. So I want you guys uh, to take a moment and to trace through this flow of code that if it's not signaled ever, as in no one manages to press control C to send a sig int here uh, in the midst of running this, then the normal behavior that you'd expect to see is just to see a seven on it. That if you looked at the logic associated with F up here, it's gonna return seven and we're printing out the return value of V here, it's down seven. Uh, if we do get a signal at some point, uh, you would probably naively and normally expect that I'll see a 19 and then a seven uh, printed along those lines. Uh, that either the seven shows up first and then the 19, depending on when the signal is caught, uh, or a 19 and then a seven. Uh, but there is one specific flow through this code that subverts both of those sort of normal looking behaviors. Uh, and so I'd like you guys to spend a moment, and examine this and tell me what flow of code here, um, when could I deliver a signal that would get 19 to show up twice? Uh, keep in mind that normally this F function, when invoked with one, two, returns seven, when invoked with four, five, returns 19. Uh, but it's possible uh, to see 19 twice on here, despite how this might outwardly look uh, uh, at, at first. And then explain to yourself, at least, 
why is it that this f function, which is being called both in main and in the signal handler, why is it non-reentrant? Uh, why is it dangerous to call in both of those spots? Take a second, think about this one, uh, and get back to me. All right, that's probably long enough, uh, or pause now if you want to con contemplate this further. Uh, so if we scan ahead uh, and, or, well, actually, no, uh, we'll work through this uh, quickly. Now, importantly, the main source of trouble with f is that it uses a global variable up here, and this is automatically going to make it non-reentrant. Uh, it's easily avoidable, as in most of you look at this just say, well, pop an int a z here, and that'll make a local instead, and this would fix a lot of the non-reentrant problems for it. Before we make that fix, uh, let's consider exactly this flow that could potentially happen uh, that would cause z uh, to corrupt uh, later, uh, um, um, sort of, um, sorry, uh, cause 19 to show up twice on that front. Um, so as we start running, we'll have to let the signal handler come first. Uh, and then in this flow, we're going to let the f function start running with the arguments uh, 1, 2. Uh, and up here, as I start running, uh, I'll calculate 1 plus 2, that's 3 in temp. Uh, and then uh, temp ties 3 plus 1, so that's 3 by 2 is 6, and then plus 1 is 7. And I store that in z. And that's at this spot between lines four and five being executed. Uh, that's when I'm going to say a signal is delivered. Uh, and it's this sig int, which will kick control away from z for the moment, suspending with uh, I'm just about to execute line five, which is return z, uh, and put me into the signal handler. Now, so control is suspended in this original version, but you can see the first line of z, or first line of the signal handler, uh, is to call f again. Uh, so I get a new stack frame uh, with 4 and 5 for x and y up here. So that'd be 4 and 5 is 9 in temp. Uh, temp times 2 is uh, 18. That's 9 by 2. Uh, and then add 1, that's a 19. So that gets stored into z. And importantly, there's only one z. It was storing 7 a moment ago, but by virtue of running this signal handler at this exact moment, I'm going to overwrite the 7 with a 19. That gets returned from f. Uh, and print it out in the signal handler. So presently now Z has a 19 in it, uh, and I'll print 19 on the screen because uh, that's assigned to T then. Uh, that completes execution of the signal handler, and it will then restore the normal control flow of the program, picking up uh, at the main invocation where F was running. F doesn't restart, it just picks up right here at line 5 where it received the signal uh, to begin with suspended. Uh, so at this point, this function f thinks I've computed my value, stored it in z, it was 7. Uh, unbeknownst to it, the signal handler has actually changed that to 19, so it's going to return a 19 uh, down here, which gets stored in z, and so I get the second uh, 19 printed out. Uh, if that hand waviness uh, didn't exactly do it for you, the next slide has a fairly uh, detailed textural version of this. Uh, where I execute some lines in main, uh, execute some lines in f, uh, but then right before uh, I return z at line 5 over here, uh, that's where I get the interrupt. Uh, this suspends the normal execution of the program. I do the signal handler and the execution of f. That gets me my first 19, and then the signal handler uh, return is finished, so I go back to normal control and uh, return z, which has now been changed to 19. So largely then, it's the presence of these global variables uh, that uh, would make a function uh, non-reentrant and then causes folks like us to have to worry about is it safe for me to call this function in uh, or not uh, in, a, in a signal handler. To that end, uh, you can see some easy fixes for if you're writing your own code to make your functions non-reentrant. And this is one of those spots where then all those years of professors and teachers hounding you that global variables are somewhat dangerous. If you adhere to that, then you'd avoid these kinds of problems almost entirely. Uh, that locals uh, for Z would make sure that that exists only in the stack, and each time F is called, it has a separate stack instance, uh, so we wouldn't have that problem. Uh, to that end, uh, it's not possible to change other system calls that you didn't write that are part of the Unix parlance. And we've already seen that there is one of these out there that get PW name. Seen allusions to malloc and printf, uh, very important C functions, not being uh, reentrant. And we'll want to talk a little bit about why in a moment. Uh, but let's uh, then sort of see strategies associated with this uh, that you can make use of if it's not an option to change 
a function that is not reentrant to be reentrant, but instead you have to deal with that somehow. Uh, so as a leading example, I want to look at another uh, set of system calls uh, that are not reentrant. Uh, this crypt not reentrant.c file, which is part of your code pack, demonstrates the use of the crypt function. Uh, this one has nothing to do with uh, zombies or uh, the undead in some sort of uh, place uh, of burial. Uh, instead, this is uh, cryptography, uh, as in encrypt uh, a password. And this is a standard Unix function that's usually used on most systems that when a user uh, puts in, types in a new password, uh, it's encrypted using this. And it's also how then uh, the system checks that when you type your plain text password in, it will call crypts and check it against the encrypted results that are stored in the operating system's record of passwords. So crypt is a, you know, a reasonably important function that uh, sees use in various parts of the uh, Unix systems. We're going to see in this crypt not reentrant.c file uh, that it shows up again both in a main while loop and in the signal handler. Uh, so let's examine and try and determine why is it that crypt is dangerous and non reentrance and what um, effect does this have? Uh, the same basic setup uh, is that we'll have a long while loop that encrypts things but then occasionally gets an alarm that interrupts it to go into the signal handler and this is where trouble is going to arise. Uh, so similar to our first uh, example, here's the crypt not reentrant. Uh, again, basic setup uh, is I have some global variables, uh, a password up here. Uh, interestingly, there's a notion of salt, which is just uh, some uh, value that's determined usually at the point of encrypting. Uh, we'll pick zeros uh, for this uh, here, but it makes it uh, harder in encryption settings to use dictionary attacks against folks. If you're curious about those things, uh, go read some more about it, uh, salt and encryption. Um, uh, good Google terms on that. Here's our alarm handler, and as promised, uh, in here I am going to crypt uh, the password, that uh, very safe password, uh, password123, uh, along with the salt, and get myself just an array of characters back. Uh, and this should immediately start to bother you a little bit, is that, okay, crypt, uh, it returns a pointer to some characters. And if you look carefully throughout this signal handler, there isn't any presence of freeing this crypted text. Uh, I'm definitely going to print it out so I can see it uh, and print out a few other things that are in here. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm going to check uh, in the uh, um, the encryption or sorry, in the alarm handler to see uh, if what I encrypted actually matches some reference uh, that's present. Uh, this is slightly dangerous, but that part on uh, this reference being a global variable that's only important uh, for the demonstration. Uh, it doesn't sort of alter any of the behavior of the cryptid business. But the fact that it returns a pointer to characters that I never free anywhere in here, and if you scan ahead, same thing down here, uh, encrypt this, get a pointer to characters here, and never free it, is indication that this is a pointer uh, to something that, if I don't need to deallocate it, then it's probably globally allocated. Uh, it's some uh, memory area that's associated with the crypt function that it owns, but there's only one of them. And so multiple overlapping instances of crypt being called are going to create some problems. So the main loop uh, does more or less the same thing that the uh, alarm handler does, uh, except uh, sets up the alarm handler itself uh, to jump control out, uh, sets up this little reference uh, so that uh, the ref crypted uh, business that I asked for initially, uh, I'm going to copy that into this reference global variable. So each time I run the crypt function, I can see, do the results match what I think they should? Or did something go sideways in terms of uh, that encryption? Then I'll just go into this type loop where I encrypt the password, uh, check that it matches what I expect it to. Uh, if not, exit otherwise, increment successes, and loop back around. Um, so if we GCC this one, uh, you see crypt uh, not reentrant. Uh, the first thing that you see is that uh, you get compile problems uh, because this crypt function is actually stored in a library uh, that is Unix specific and not linked by default. And so if you bop back up to the top here, you'll see some compilation instructions. Uh, you have to link the crypt library uh, to this code because it's making use of a function that's not in the standard C library, not in the standard Unix libraries in the kernel, uh, but instead is in another OS library, L, uh, libcrypt. Uh, so just tacking that on here, just the dash L crypt, uh, that gets me uh, my A dot out. And if I run it, you'll see sort of similar output to what we saw before of, uh, let's see, uh, a lot of successes, but eventually something goes sideways. Uh, that the reference of what I am trying to uh, 
um, and crypt should look like this, uh, that, that PHYLV uh, business, uh, that in this tight loop down here, I get lots of encryptions uh, that match that, uh, lots of successes on that front. Uh, when I get a signal, I jump up and execute the signal handler code and get exactly what it was uh, that I expected on that front. But on coming back, I land in this string comparison where I compare whatever was just completed in terms of that crypt. Uh, does it match uh, this thing, which is the correct uh, sort of um, uh, response for the encrypted business, uh, but instead see utter garbage down here. Uh, this UCMD business uh, that is much different uh, compared to what I expect there. Uh, now, it shouldn't come as a surprise then based on our context that this is happening because crypt is calling uh, some function, uh, or sorry, is executing some function that relies on this global variable that it's returning, um, staying fixed that while this uh, crypt instance here in the main loop uh, is being executed, it's changing the characters that are in here. It's probably also using some internal state variables as encryption variables often do uh, that dictate, okay, I encrypted this character as this, I'm gonna adjust my internal state and then also use that internal state along with the character that I'm looking at to produce a new character. Uh, most encryption algorithms like that are stateful in some way so that uh, given the same sequence, you get the same results, but giving slightly different sequences, uh, you get varied results on, on, on that front. Um, so to that end, both the global string and the global states that Crypt is using, uh, it's reused up here uh, in the alarm handler. Uh, but then when I returned um, in the middle of that encryption algorithm, uh, but it's been buggered by the earlier call that was done during the signal handler. There's nothing that we can do uh, to fix Crypt at this point. It is tied completely to a global variable. Uh, and I have some personal experience with this because uh, in an earlier class that I taught, we wanted to do password crackers. And the obvious choice to sort of use uh, to check if a password is correct is just crypt function. Uh, and I stumbled immediately because uh, this crypt function is not thread safe. Uh, it, because it's non-reentrant and uses these global variables, uh, you're, you cannot call it from multiple different threads at once. Uh, the point of password crackers is to try as many possibilities as fast as possible. So using multiple threads to simultaneously pound on breaking a password uh, is a good idea. It's completely defeated if the crypt function itself uh, can't be called effectively for multiple threads. Uh, and so uh, to that end, uh, we would need some ways to work around this. Uh, the first is to go and find the source code thing and rewrite it. But in cases where performance wasn't critical, that instead you just needed this to happen reasonably fast in a while loop like this, uh, and occasionally uh, handle uh, things properly in alarm handler. There are a few things that one can do uh, in order to protect critical calls like this uh, that cannot be interrupted by signals. So this motivates us then uh, for the next uh, section, which is uh, to discuss how do you block signals? Uh, to that end, we need first a little bit of a discussion about a data structure. Uh, well, I mean, data structures may be a generous term, um, but uh, I'll call it a data structure uh, nonetheless. Uh, it's a, a signal set, as in some data structure that represents uh, a bunch of true falses of yes, this signal is in my set, or no, it's not. There are a bunch of functions associated with this small data structure uh, present in your standard signal libraries. Uh, Signal.h would Give definition uh, to sig empty set, sig fill set, uh, sig add set, uh, and the struct sig set underscore t. Uh, like a lot of uh, data structures uh, in the sort of Unix paradigm, these are supposed to be sort of a black box, and the data that's actually associated with this set, uh, you're not supposed to necessarily know what's involved in it, but we're gonna guess at it anyway. Uh, and we'll see then that the only way that you're supposed to interact with this stuff uh, is to make use of calls along these lines. Uh, to create an empty set, to fill it up, uh, to add a specific signal to the set as in it's present, uh, or remove it from the set so that it's not present. Uh, and you can also check then uh, whether or not a particular signal is a member of that set. Uh, just to get your head around this uh, before we start putting it to use, uh, let's have a look at this sigsetsdemo.c. Um, uh, so that is here, sigsetsdemo. Uh, uh, the basic setup is to declare someplace uh, this sigsets uh, set business. 
Uh, and then you, as an undeclared sort of variable here, or uh, uh, sort of, uh, it's declared, but it's uh, not been initialized. I'd initialize it oftentimes with uh, either an empty or a filled set here. And note the C convention that if I want to this function sig empty set to modify and change the value for the local set, uh, pass it in uh, using its address, uh, address of set. And that's done uh, throughout to, for instance, add three signals in this case, uh, sig int, sig term, and sig user one. Uh, so they're going to ask about things like, uh, is a particular sig uh, signal like sig int present in this set or not? Uh, so to that, and this is a fairly a simple interface. Uh, and one, uh, if you're a sort of curious computer scientist, you might start to wonder like, what is this data structure under the hood? You know, and there are lots of set da like data structures that uh, you've probably learned in um, your data structures course. Uh, for instance, hash tables are good for this. Uh, and minor search trees, particularly if they're balanced, like a red, black, or an AVL tree, uh, those are good for sets. Uh, but in truth, the situation associated with signals is quite simple compared to general purpose sets. Uh, signals all have a number, uh, 1 to 32 or 1 to 64 or something like that. Uh, and in all likelihood, a signal set is nothing more than a 32 or 64 bit with integer where the individual bits, like bit one, bit two, bit 15, uh, bit nine, and so forth, if it's a zero, then the signal associated with it, uh, for instance, uh, 15 is sig term, uh, that signal uh, would be present or not present based on whether bit 15 was a one for present or a zero for not present. And all these add sets and empty sets and uh, uh, deletes and so forth, all they're doing is manipulating bits in that integer. This is an incredibly efficient way uh, to handle small sets that where you have an obvious sort of numbering of the things that are in there. And that's very obvious for signals. It's uh, built right into them. Uh, and it's very efficient because it's just uh, eight bytes in the case of a 64-bit integer of memory. Uh, you don't need any pointers anyplace else. And the operations associated with adding, removing, and clearing sets like this are uh, super efficient. So in most cases, you can expect a signal set like this to be uh, one or more um, integers uh, sort of stacked together in a single spot rather than something complex like a tree or a hash table or a list or an array or something like that. Um, to that end, uh, what these signal sets are really good for is uh, to set up blocking of signals. We alluded to this earlier on in our first discussion uh, where we're talking about, oh, signals as they come in, you can handle them, that you have this dis uh, default disposition in your program that you can adjust. Uh, in some cases, you can ignore the signals. But in all cases at that point, the signals are actually being delivered. And you can make requests that uh, the operating system just delay delivery entirely, uh, known as blocking the signals. Uh, and it's only at the point that a process would unblock that it would actually receive any pending signals that have been sent that the operating system is put on hold uh, until the uh, signals, uh, until the uh, process unblocks it. Um, so you'll hear uh, mentions of this that there's a, a sort of uh, uh, signal mask associated with processes, and that's uh, mentioned down here, uh, that establishes what it's allowing through and what it blocks. Uh, the calling convention for this thing is a little bit weird, but it starts out with that sig set data structure that we just mentioned. And you usually need two of these. Uh, first, there's a set that you want to change the process's mask to. And there's also a set that will be uh, set to whatever the current uh, uh, settings are. Uh, and so uh, in the case that I wanted to block all signals, and that's what we're going to do in just a second, uh, it, it's the case that this sig fill set business, uh, the fill set will take this block all and they'll fill in with all um, uh, trues, as in every signal uh, is in this set now. Uh, if you saw, call sig proc mask now, uh, and with the uh, key value, the symbol uh, sig set mask, uh, uh, then the current process mask associated with signals, uh, it gets changed to this block all, so that's all signals are gonna be blocked now. Uh, but simultaneously, the sig proc mask will populate this uh, defaults guy with whatever the process mask was before, and this will make it easy to restore things in a moment. Now uh, that this is a saving of what I had in terms of um, the signal disposition uh, in terms of blocking a, a moment ago. Uh, to demonstrate, uh, let's just have a look quick at this no interruptions block. Uh, and this goes back to uh, that Manamna uh, business that we've talked about several times. 
uh, in our first sort of leading part of that, but change this over uh, so that um, the handler that's up here is probably actually never going to get called, or at least not called immediately. Um, in main, I'll use the approach that was outlined in the slide to say set up a little mask uh, or set up a little set of signals, uh, fill it up with all possible signals, and then change the process mask uh, so that it's currently blocking all signals. Uh, that's this line of code here that says set the process mask to block all uh, and re retain the defaults that I have right now in this other set that's over here. Uh, now I can go ahead and set up a, a signal handler for a sig int over here, but we'll see initially uh, this is not called at all. Uh, be, even though I'm sending control C's uh, to it, uh, since all the signals have been blocked to this, uh, there's just no delivery of the sig int at all. Uh, and so the main loop here just goes through its sleep for a second, call, um, print out manamana, uh, and after five iterations of that, uh, we will restore the original settings uh, of the signals. Uh, this is where I'll call sig uh, proc mask again. I'll set the mask to be whatever the original defaults were uh, that were obtained up here before I blocked everything. Um, so uh, in terms of dynamic action, uh, GCC that no interruptions. Uh, and this is the blocking version of that. Uh, I run this thing. Uh, and if I type control C right now, you see it's completely unresponsive that I'm not getting any of the uh, handler behavior of say no interruptions up here. Uh, so to that end, uh, after a while, this program does the uh, restoring uh, default signals. Uh, that's this after a count of five down here, uh, the process max has changed to unblock signals uh, and give me the default thing. So now when I can type control C, uh, I get uh, delivery of those signals and I see the handler up here is actually done. Um, you can actually see this uh, down here that as soon as uh, the code restores the default uh, signals, the control C's up here that I was typing, they get delivered uh, to uh, the program and I immediately get this no interruptions. As in, finally, after unmasking the signals, um, the signal, the control C that I was typing gets delivered and so I'll run the handler code up here. You also notice that despite typing control C three times, I only get one run of the signal handler down here. After restoring, I see no interruptions exactly once. Uh, I typed control C a bunch of times up here uh, and would in some cases expect maybe I should see no interruptions three times, three control C's or six control C's. Uh, that should give me six calls as handler. But this gives you an idea that the operating system, uh, when it's blocking signals like that, it actually just says, okay, someone wants a control C, a sig int to go to this program. It's on block. Another one comes in. That's okay. We've already got one pending. So it will merge all of those into a single delivery. Uh, it's important that if you're trying to write delicate signal handler code, you be aware that the operating system sometimes merges requests like that together. Now this thing is still uh, kicking along down at the bottom. You can see my CPU isn't actually affected too much because this is a very um, uh, unintensive program where the sleeping here takes no CPU time uh, and then I just a little printing uh, down here. But uh, since I would like to get rid of this thing uh, anyway, uh, let me send a signal it can't stop, uh, control uh, Z, uh, which suspends it, uh, and then I'll kill it with the uh, dash nine or the one that it can't kill. Uh, actually, I can do this just with a kill because um, uh, it's not uh, handling that term signal, so this gets rid of it. Um, so, uh, at any rate, this gives you an idea then of some of the semantics of this signal blocking business that's established most readily using these signal sets and the sig proc mask. This conversation was motivated by the need to occasionally deal with system calls uh, that are non-reentrant and so are dangerous uh, to interrupt using signal handlers. Uh, and so this rounds us back around to talk about how one might create a uh, safe version of this crypt call that we saw in the crypt not reentrant.c function. The exercise, uh, for those of you who would be following along at home and don't want to be spoon-fed the answer, is to go into that code and make changes to it uh, to set up at the appropriate moment blocking of signals. Now, it's important uh, to state that in most cases, you don't want to permanently block all signals uh, to a process uh, forever. Uh, this makes it uh, probably unlikely that users will um, be happy with the program because they can't send signals like please shut down gracefully right now. 
And so what we'll uh, essentially want to do is to protect the critical region or the critical section of code. Uh, there's a part in that uh, bit of code uh, that should not be interrupted by a signal handler. And typically it's whatever function is non-reentrant, block signals before you run that one, and then unblock them afterward. Uh, take a moment, examine that code, and see if you can determine exactly where it is that you should block signals and uh, then unblock them to get the maximum amount of space uh, for the program to receive signals while still protecting that critical region uh, from interruption. Take just a second, uh, I'll pop up the code over here so you can start uh, having a look at it uh, in the slide. And if you're falling on home, I encourage you to pull this one up as well. Uh, here is, I think you get most of it uh, in here. Uh, here's the bulk of that code. Uh, so you'd wanna figure out what line numbers uh, should I modify to both set up the blocking, uh, where should I block, uh, and then where should I unblock signals. Take a moment, uh, think it over, chat it over with someone else if you're working along with them, uh, and then uh, we'll resume in a moment with answers to that. All right, uh, so that should be, hopefully, if you paused, enough time to consider uh, where the right spot is uh, to uh, uh, block and unblock. Uh, to that end, I just want to copy some code over because it'll make it a little bit faster uh, because we're definitely going to want to do one of these block alls and then have uh, defaults over here. So let me just copy this code uh, up top up here. Uh, I don't want to actually invoke this uh, uh, blocking at this point, though, because uh, that would be early and sort of start the program off uh, being uh, blocked everything. The most important spot to protect uh, is down here in the main loop, when I call the dangerous function. Uh, so this uh, cryptid business that happens in the main loop, uh, it's the one that we saw if it's interrupted, as in while this crypt function is being called, if I get the alarm signal, uh, things can go sideways. Uh, to that end, it's as easy as follows. I'm gonna paste in uh, block all signals right before this call, uh, and then right afterwards, unblock them. Uh, so I'll copy this other line of code over here uh, that unblock signals uh, and uh, set that here. So this is a block, do the critical thing, and then unblock. There are a couple of other spots that this might be worthwhile uh, to uh, sort of block. Uh, for instance, the initial call up here, that might be worthwhile, but since it happens once at the beginning of the code and most of the signals here are coming from alarms, uh, then that's probably sufficient. It might also want to block and unblock things uh, during the signal handler itself. Um, the, that's... Uh, something we won't go into, but is, is probably important. Uh, there are some options that you can set up with SIG action to say, while I am running the function up here, this alarm handler block functions and then or block signals and then unblock them when the um, alarm handler uh, is done executing, that would probably be better to twiddle with the options to SIG action to get that effect. So at the moment, this is the only thing I'm going to modify, and I'm fairly certain that this is all that we need to do in order to get this uh, to work out right. So I'll uh, recall that GCC uh, where we were compiling this thing. Uh, and what we're looking for now is that this just works continuously. Whereas before we got errors, uh, this should just uh, keep going. And it looks pretty good so far that uh, as the signal handler runs, uh, encrypts, and then I continue getting successes after this, uh, you can see my CPU is uh, working a little bit harder on this one because it's actually to do, able to do those encryptions uh, uh, much uh, faster uh, otherwise than the uh, sleep print loop down here. Uh, thankfully, I haven't blocked all signals right now. Uh, I can just uh, execute the control C to kill this thing. And because I'm sanitarily blocking for an unblocking in the sort of shortest part of the code that I can get away with to protect it, uh, there's an almost immediate response to that control C there. Uh, to that end, we'll see this paradigm used over and over, that this is a critical section where some resource that is shared by potential multiple things, and in this case, it's the hidden global variable associated with crypt, uh, that needs to be protected in some way. And so some setup that surrounds it allows this critical region to execute uh, in some way that is protected. We'll see this come up uh, again when we study threads, where usually there'll be some global resource that's shared among several threads, and a typical regime is gonna to be to lock that resource, execute some code, and then unlock it. Uh, any code uh, uh, that is attempting to sort of lock a region uh, that can't acquire the lock just goes on hold until the lock is released, allowing one thing through in that front. 
Uh, and essentially that's what we've done here. Uh, we said that for this region, I don't wanna be interrupted so that this other bit of code, the alarm handler runs. Uh, so blocking the signals in this case allows for that to happen. Uh, before I leave this, uh, I need to undo these changes because I'm constantly like putting correct code in saving it and then uh, the students in the next semester get that stuff. But if you want the correct answer to this, uh, there is a crypt protected up here, uh, which accomplishes uh, more or less exactly what we did uh, and has uh, also some additional um, uh, commenting on it. Uh, so to that end, we could probably be a little bit more efficient with the uh, blocking and unblocking. You don't need to do the loop, but um, I'll leave you guys to uh, analyze that on your own. All right, so then with this new business in town, it's right to discuss for just a few minutes uh, the relation of signals uh, and their handling, uh, which is a software mechanism, uh, to relate that to some other operating system concepts. In particular, there are some analogous instances of this uh, at the hardware level. Uh, our first example of this is something that folks may have experienced uh, at various points in programming when things go sideways, uh, and that the division by zero uh, in most arithmetic logic units will actually cause the processor to generate a signal that goes straight to the operating system that some sort of a fault has occurred. Uh, we're going to analyze in just a moment this div0.c code. Um, this signal business is interesting in that it reflects sort of what the signals in software looks like, except the thing that's generated in this case uh, is the processor itself, uh, that this division instruction as it executes, if the divisor, uh, the bottom part of that is zero, uh, then the CPU will trigger some additional operating system code uh, to run, uh, which in most cases causes the operating system to send a software signal to the program that was doing it. Now, software signals uh, can uh, be caught in this way, uh, and you'll see, if you look carefully at that list, there's this SIG FPE, floating point exception, uh, that comes uh, to programs as they try to divide by zero. I have to say, this is the worst name signal and error ever, because the FPE part of this is very uh, non-intuitively, like it's mentioning floating point, but this is really an integer division problem. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is then uh, the origin of this, uh, this process uh, comes from a hardware uh, sort of fault of some kind, uh, but then the way that your program will see it is through a software signal. And that shows up in several spots. For instance, we've already seen alarms, uh, which are based on some sort of hardware level feature uh, that has a timer built into it, which will generate an electrical signal. Uh, that hardware signal is handled by the operating system and causes it to send a software signal to your program. But before we get our head of ourselves, let's just look quickly at this div0.c uh, and see what it does. It has slightly unpredictable output here. Uh, so more non-intuitive output. Uh, so down here, we have uh, the following setup. Uh, there's a handler, and uh, as indicated, uh, there's a bit of stuff that's printed here to indicate that a divide by zero is like the cause of it, and that cause is solidified when you see here that this setup is tied to the SIG FPE, uh, the floating point exception or division by zero uh, signal. Uh, this handler is run every time the program would receive that. Uh, and looking here at this code, we're going to definitely trigger that by dividing one by zero uh, with this instruction over here. Uh, and a uh, naive sort of look at this might say, okay, I can see the control flow here. Uh, I'm going to set up the signal handler. I'm gonna do this division by zero. I'm gonna see this divide by zero down here, and then I'm gonna see this uh, result eventually, uh, which is whatever uh, the interpretation of dividing uh, one by zero is. Um, that, for a naive viewer, uh, is what you might expect. And of course, we're talking about this because uh, that's not at all what's gonna happen. Uh, instead, as I compile this thing and run it, you see this absurdity that divide by zero is uh, just trying again over and over and over again. Uh, and so it's important to understand what the hell is actually going on here because there are no loops present here. Uh, and so one would wonder why I'm seeing the signal handler run over and over and over again. Uh, if you like, take just a moment and mull that over. Try to relate it back to exactly how the signal handling mechanism uh, played out in earlier cases. 
So if you take a moment to consider, what you should try to remember is that signals, as they are delivered to a program, they interrupt an instruction that's being executed. And when the signal handler that's to attend to those signals finishes, then the instruction that uh, was interrupted, it starts over, as in this thing didn't get a chance to complete, and so we will restart it from wherever it was. Importantly then, in the case we're in right now, this instruction division by zero is the one that generates this signal, but it's also then the instruction that is being interrupted. And so the process that we'll see here is that, uh, I should get line numbers up here to, to make this uh, more salient, is that during the execution of line 20, uh, a signal is received that you know, a floating point exception has occurred. Uh, the compiler and the runtime engine have no idea of knowing that, oh, it was actually this instruction 20 that caused that signal to be sent uh, by virtue of divide by zero, getting this hardware uh, interrupt, and then the operating system sending a, the floating point exception. So uh, essentially what happens is 20 is interrupted because of this floating point exception. We run the handler and then restart 20, which generates another floating point exception, which runs the handler, restarts 20, and generates another floating point exception. And so stuck in this tight loop between signal handler and restarting uh, an instruction that is uh, going to handle uh, that, that signal and then generate yet another one, uh, that explains the behavior that we see over here and also illustrates why it's probably not possible to handle division by zero uh, in any way in your program. That it's just not, at least in C programs, uh, going to play out. Now, C doesn't have uh, a, a mechanism like exception handling that's present in most other modern programming environments, but it does have something else uh, that we won't have time to talk about. Uh, the notion of jumps and long jumps, which actually, which actually are sort of how most exception handling mechanisms are implemented under the hood in modern languages. Uh, this would actually allow you within the signal handler uh, to change the next instruction to be executed so that it wasn't the offending instruction here. Uh, but that's a bit beyond the scope of what we're going to try and do here. Uh, just note then that this illustrates one of the behaviors associated with signals uh, and their delivery, that it interrupts an instruction uh, and will restart that same instruction once the handler is finished. Uh, importantly, if the instruction itself is the one that is generating the problem, for instance, in this case, a floating point exception, or also uh, an instruction that accesses memory that's out of bounds, which would trigger a, uh, a, a segmentation fault, uh, then you can have a handler that tries to correct things like, oh, you divide by zero, that's okay, we can carry on from that, or, oh, you access this memory that's out of bounds, so that's okay, we'll carry on. Just note that the instruction that trigger the problem is going to get started uh, right back again. Uh, and to that end, it is probably not what worth in trying to handle signals along these lines. Um, so then, uh, to lay out a little bit more terminology that is not going to be central to our class, but bears mentioning, uh, there is a distinction within the OS and hardware community uh, between several different things. Generally, these are electrical signals that are generated by various parts of the computing system, the processor itself, the memory management units, uh, the peripheral hardware like keyboards and mice and printers and so forth. Um, these electrical signals notify the CPU that something has happened and usually cause the CPU to suspend one of those instructions is executing in the normal program and do something uh, in the operating system sort of table of what to, how to respond uh, to those uh, electric signals. Uh, there's the notion of a trap, uh, and it's the case that this is usually a, an assembly instruction itself, which triggers an electrical signal that gets operating system code to run. We saw this with the div by zero business. We'll also uh, see this is uh, to some extent possible uh, with some other uh, kinds of instructions. Uh, the notion of a trap then is that it's uh, handled synchronously, as in, oh, this instruction generated that signal, and so we know right where to pick up execution uh, once it, uh, we would resume. Uh, that it's actually the instruction itself that sort of generates uh, the problem. Although we saw that associated with zero, uh, the division uh, problem that the restart of this uh, just generates another uh, um, instruct, uh, generates another uh, uh, hardware signal that kicks you back in the operating system. So uh, to that end, there are easier versions of this that we'll see in just a second. Um, 
The interrupt, on the other hand, usually doesn't come from the CPU itself. It usually comes from some other device. Uh, for instance, a disk drive that has completed an operation, uh, possibly the memory management uh, unit to indicate like, hey, that address that you asked me to translate, I couldn't actually find a physical mapping for it because it wasn't in the page table. Uh, things along those lines. So as the CPU is clipping along, it may be well beyond in terms of the instruction uh, that initiated some activity, like, like spinning up the disk drive, uh, when it gets some sort of an interrupt that says, hold on, something needs my attention. And in that case, uh, this interrupt will jump the CPU to some set of routines that the operating system established uh, to handle whatever that interrupt is. Uh, the important distinction here is that this can happen at any time, as in not associated with an individual instruction, but at any point in any code that's uh, being executed, uh, this interrupt business uh, can trigger. Uh, one of the beautiful things that you get access to as you start coding the operating system itself is you start to become acquainted with the internals of the hardware to say that, oh, um, there are a bunch of pins that are associated with the processor that when I would get an electrical signal on this pin, it will actually run some code that I pre-specify that's in this memory location. Uh, this is something that operating system um, implementers have to worry about quite a bit because it's how the CPU uh, directs the activities of the other parts of the computing system. Uh, anything that you have in terms of USB mice and keyboards, uh, I think you have in terms of a network connection, it's constantly generating electrical signals uh, associated with uh, the, uh, the activities on the system, and the CPU is ultimately responsible for running some routine that is uh, gonna handle that activity. Usually by scheduling something uh, later on to indicate, oh, like this interrupted me, which means this thing is ready to do, and so I'll mention or adjust some data structure that I handle that uh, later on when I have time. Uh, but in order to keep the flow fairly consistent uh, with this asynchronous uh, activity uh, for interrupts, those interrupt handlers are usually very, very short. And later on, we'll see some examples of how this looks uh, associated with uh, signal handling as well. Uh, for a moment, though, uh, we're just going to end this with a discussion of uh, the terminology uh, that is sort of difficult to understand and a little bit muddy uh, on uh, the front of exactly what is uh, this stuff at the hardware uh, and OS level. So I mentioned that there's this distinction between a trap, which happens synchronously, as in this instruction generates an electric signal, versus an interrupt usually comes from outside the CPU uh, from some other device and can happen at any point. Uh, but it's uh, sort of interesting to examine historically uh, what these things uh, look like uh, at the assembly level. Modern systems uh, in 32-bit and 64-bit, uh, there's these instructions, at least in x86-64, uh, to execute operating system code, uh, sysenter or syscall in the 64-bit business. But previous to that, in earlier versions of the Intel processor, you actually had this weird interrupt uh, instruction. Uh, it was called int, and if you wanted to call to the operating system, you do something like execute the assembly instruction int uh, ox80, that's 128. Um, this would uh, generate an interrupt signal uh, that would kick control over to the operating system. Uh, the 128 here has to do with uh, which interrupt handler it was, and this is a general system call, if I remember right. Uh, but prior to doing this, you'd set a bunch of registers to say which system call do I want to do. Uh, here are the arguments to it and so forth. Uh, but the strangeness here is that, okay, this is an instruction. Uh, the instruction name itself is interrupt, which implies, according to the terminology, that this is supposed to be an asynchronous thing. But here is the assembly instruction itself that is causing uh, the the signal to be generated. So the fact that this assembly instruction happens uh, synchronously and generates that signal would make you think it should be a trap instead. So why they call it the interrupt instructions? Like, I had no idea. This is terribly confusing, huh? but the main point is if you wanted to get the operating system to take control in older 32-bit code, uh, this is the instruction that would do it. Uh, and it would call into the operating system by triggering one of these electrical signals. Um, so to that end, uh, don't let this nonsense sort of cause you to want to change your major. Uh, instead, just acknowledge that things are better now because you have designated assembly instructions that are specifically for calling to the operating system rather than uh, generating an arbitrary interrupt, one of which happens to coincide with uh, the operating system. So then, uh, the take-home on the signal business. 
uh, is that they are an interesting sort of piece of the Unix architecture that allows asynchronous communication to happen, primarily via these kill command line and kill system call uh, uh, functions. Uh, and programs then can establish a disposition, there's one by default, on how signals will be responded to. Uh, they can also establish these custom handlers to say, uh, specifically I don't just want to ignore or die when this happens, uh, there's some specific activities that I want to uh, take care of. We will continue to use signals in uh, interesting ways as we move forwards, uh, but have to be cousin of this uh, non-reentrant business, uh, that the amount of stuff that you can do effectively in a signal handler that won't get you in trouble, uh, this is fairly limited. Uh, this has also uh, caused us to see some interactions with other things like the sleep and pause uh, system calls, which put your program on hold until it receives a signal, or in the case of sleep, uh, go a certain amount of time has uh, passed by. And we also see uh, timing issues associated with that, and that there's this other alarm function that can arrange for after a certain time has elapsed, a signal be delivered to notify your program that, hey, a certain amount of time has elapsed, uh, maybe you want to do that thing uh, that you were uh, talking about uh, earlier. Um, so to that end, uh, signals are not a very good general purpose uh, s communication mechanism, but they have the advantage of being bound to certain keystrokes and having some pre-built semantics like uh, shut down gracefully associated with them. Uh, we'll employ those in some programs that we write as we move forwards. Uh, certainly uh, in the next few projects, uh, supposing that I get them out, uh, we will definitely deal with signal handling uh, to affect the common sort of shutdown sequence that a lot of programs do. Uh, and to that end, look forward to working with them uh, some more in the future. Thanks, and uh, next week we will begin our discussion uh, of additional topics. Now you can see what's coming up on the course schedule. Uh, so that is here in 4061. Uh, after we've completed our signal discussion, we're going to start discussing more inter-process communication mechanisms that are general purpose. Uh, we've seen that pipes are somewhat better uh, to allow a parent and a child process uh, to communicate, and so we'll talk about those, uh, revisiting them, and also talk about their analog in the file system, something called a FIFO, uh, which is essentially a pipe that has a name on the file system that looks sort of like a, a file. Uh, then we'll move on to further general purpose inter-process communication facilities. Uh, some of that stuff may come up on the exam, uh, but we'll also be looking backwards at some of the file directory structures, virtual memory stuff as well. Stay tuned uh, for that stuff uh, coming up, uh, and I'll see you next time.